Tone is, is the best thing about guitar, at least for today's discussion. So uh, our problem is, you know, how can we make the guitar sound gorgeous? I don't mean good interpretation and fast scales, but I mean sound gorgeous. You know, it's not sounding like, if I do it with the other hand, it sounds <laughs> not so good. But this hand is, is highly trained and has got a lot going on that make it sound good. Okay, so the solution is we probably need to establish some practice, some protocols, some technique that will produce the best possible tone for our body at this moment on any particular guitar. And it should be the same on every guitar. We can make great sound. I think that a beautiful tone is enough. I mean, we need to do better. We need to be intelligent about how we play. We need to know historically what we're doing. We need to know music theory about it. We need to know a lot of things. But it's kind of like acting. I mean, if you're gorgeous and you're an actor, that can be enough. It would be great if you were a great actor and gorgeous. But in that world, you know, if you look great, you can pretty much work. Now, in music, it's not that simple, but you could probably get by a lot better with this with gorgeous tone more than you could get by with playing like Paganini's 24th Caprice with bad tone. Most people will like the good tone part better. You just gotta trust me on this. And finally I think that if we spend the time doing the work it would take to really get good tone, we'll also learn what it sounds like and feels like for a note to exist from its inception uh, this is a nice guitar, it sustains really well, until it is no longer uh, audible. If we know what that feels like from the beginning to the end of a note, we're going to know a lot more about what to do with a note. Okay, so let's talk about how to do this. It's very objective techniques. We know how to do it. It's been practiced forever. I mean, I hate to keep talking about Segovia, but Segovia made the guitar sound as beautiful probably as it can. And he taught lots of students who became our teachers how to make that tone. So the first thing we need to do is consider how do we make the sound happen. Traditionally, we take the tip of the finger and we touch the string first with that because it's soft and then it touches the nail a microsecond later and that gives the power and the strong sort of move the string with forte it gives that to our stroke okay first we'll need to shape our nails in a way that takes advantage of the softness of the flesh and the hard attack of the nail now if you don't have nails, you can kind of do this. Uh, this lesson isn't about that. That's somebody else's field. I've always played with nails. Um, if you have a hard time growing nails, or if you, like I, play on steel string real hard and it tears your nails off, um, there are these lovely things called acrylic nails. I'm trying to play to all three of my cameras. Uh, and we will talk about that in another lesson, but you can create nails from uh, acrylic nail kits. And I've done it for many, many years, and I now can play with acrylic nails, and it sounds pretty much the same as when I have my normal nails. Um, not quite as good, but life's full of compromises. So whether you need to make fake nails or you have real nails that you're going to use, it doesn't matter. We're going to shape them the same. Now we want to use the flesh and the nail in just the right manner so that we can avoid two nasty sounds. One is the buzz and one is the click. It's really hard for me to make a click. I've worked so hard at not doing it. That's it. So the click happens if you don't start on the flesh first and you just hit a nail and the 
string is moving, so when the nail hits it, it kind of goes zzzz, and a couple of those sine wave things that are happening with the string hit the, the nail before you get to actually pluck it, and it, this happens in a fraction of the time that I just described, but it makes a, a click sound, and we don't want that. So the secret of not having a buzz or a click is to land, first of all, not on the nail, because if you land on the nail, it's going to buzz. If you land on the flesh first, the flesh is much softer than the nail, and it's going to make some buzz, but it may be inaudible in light of the fact that the note is going to be this big and the bzzz is that big. So don't forget a bzzz on the nail is bad. A bzzz on the flesh is not as bad. But the cool thing is we're going to land on the flesh one billionth of a millimeter from the nail. So the time it takes to get from the dampening of the flesh to the hardness of the nail and go through it will help us to avoid both the bzzz and the click. Okay, so here's the work we're going to do to get good at this. And make no mistake, there's lots of people with great tone. So this can be done. This is not easy. This isn't like just going through your scales and do arpeggios and whatever else you might think is practicing. This is really patient, uh, loving work. You have to love sound. To develop further, because this is, this is really important to, to sort of get why we're going to do this with such discipline and, and loving care. We want to make a lot of sound. As I mentioned earlier, the guitar isn't that loud, but we want to get all the sound out of we can. And the cool thing is that a nail will do that. Now a pick will do it too, but I don't know how to solve the pick problem of the bzzz, because the pick is going to make that happen because there's no soft surface before the pick strikes it. Uh, there are players, just not very many anymore, but there used to be several players that play without nails. And it's very hard to solve this problem with no nails because all you have is one component in the striking of the string. Instead of having flesh and then a nail, you just have flesh, which eventually gets a little hard because it gets some callus on it. Now, that's not to say it can't be done. Um, there was a wonderful guitarist, a Cuban guitarist named Juan Mergadal, who had beautiful tone, and he had uh, chosen to use no nails for a good part of his career. Another guitarist, Hector Garcia, um, from Cuba also. They were all students of this uh, famous guitar teacher, Emilio Pujol, who was a uh, a great teacher, uh, early 20th century, and taught lots of great students. And he played without nails, and that's because his teacher, Francisco Targa, played without nails later in his life. This is a big deal in some uh, corners of the classical guitar world. Let's just assume there's your history lesson, and you can look it up more. These are some great artists who didn't play with nails. Other than them, almost everybody is, is trying to do the solution that I'm describing to you today. So if we can uh, kind of accept that we're going to have to use flesh and nails, then the whole uh, aspect of how do we make better tone becomes easier. You still have to do the work. And here's the work. And I've taught this lesson a thousand times, or at least maybe more. Um, I've been teaching classical guitar for decades, maybe four decades, maybe five. <laughs> and this is always the first lesson. And this is the lesson that was my first lesson when I studied with Bruce Holzman at uh, Florida State University in the 70s. And it was a shocker, and I loved it. I didn't love it while he was telling me what I was going to do, but when I got to the studio afterwards, or my dorm room, I loved this work. And I loved the fruits of this work. And it's kept me it's kept me in a business that makes no sense because there's no money. Um, it's kept me spending hours and hours and hours a day for every day because I love the sound so much. So what Bruce told me was what I'm telling you today. And, and he told me the, the hours involved were greater because I was a music major. So it was going to be, you know, kind of a three-hour investment every day. This was the first week. Second week was the left-hand uh, lesson, which we'll have a little bit later. Um, not today. So he, he told me to sit 
in a place that was quiet because you need to hear the stroke from the beginning of the note until the note's gone. You need to have no distractions. If there's any distractions, you're not going to be able to pay attention. So get somewhere that's quiet and that you're not thinking about anything else except making this sound. I'm going to ask you to do it a half hour a day, maybe twice for a week. That's not the you know three hour a day commitment that I had to make. You're going to love this after it's done. You may love it while you're doing it. Don't play anything else. Don't play any of the songs that you already know because they'll just reinforce your old technique. And we're going to try and get a new technique. Okay, so you're going to play each note. You're going to listen to it until it's gone. And then you're going to get ready and play another one. So here's the technique. First of all, um, there's lots of ways to sit. The traditional way is to sit with a footstool under your left foot and the guitar at this kind of angle. Footstool could be anywhere between five and eight inches. Uh, I played that way for many, many years. Uh, it's a little bit risky for your body. <laughs> risky. I ended up with three discs being taken out of my lower back and different surgeries and a lifetime of painkillers and uh, yeah a lot of pain all all caused by sitting with a footstool I'm pretty sure unless it's all just bad karma which could be the you know the explanation for everything so I don't sit that way anymore I sit with the guitar on my right leg and nothing really supporting it except the weight of my right arm and to some degree when I'm playing the the power of my left. Sitting could be another lesson, but let's just say you're going to sit in some way where the guitar isn't at a huge angle and isn't real flat. So I've got it, you know, at this probably what 30 degrees, 35 degrees. Um, I'm bringing my arm across at the elbow. Uh, if you're sitting with a footstool, it's going to be somewhere in the middle of the forearm. When I sit this way, I bring the right arm across, right at the elbow. And that puts my hand right where I want it. Uh, if I were using a footstool, it would be more this angle and I'd be coming across probably in the middle of the forearm. The, the, the most important thing is that you have it so that your hand can land over the sound hole because that's the prettiest sound. So let's, let's leave that for now. Uh, a couple of angles to be interested in. In this case, we have uh, three things. We have arch, that's this. We have bend, that's this. And we have rotation, that's this. So what I'm doing for now is I have a pretty medium rotation. It's, it's leaning a little bit towards this knuckle. This knuckle is slightly closer to the guitar than this one. This would be equal. This is a little bit of rotation in a counterclockwise. In terms of arch, I don't really have any um, because of the way I sit with the crossing of the elbow. If I were sitting like a guitarist with a footstool, I'd probably have a little bit more, maybe five to seven degrees of arch. That's this. And then in terms of bend, I have almost no bend maybe no bend because of this position again. If I were sitting like a classical guitarist, I'd probably have three to six degrees of bend. You know, it used to be we were taught to play with a lot of bend, and then we found out that that injured more guitarists than we'd like to lose in the field, so we don't do that anymore. Um, if you have all those things worked out, what it's going to do is it's going to bring the string to about Instead of the midpoint, where are we? Okay, instead of the midpoint of the fingernail, it'll be a little bit more on the thumb side. That's going to happen on this finger also. And then on the A finger, it's going to be more towards the middle. That's not because we're doing something arbitrary. It's just that's the way that the, way that the hand's built. They fall a little bit different, and it, it all works out fine. We shape our nails a little different because of that problem. Um, as I mentioned earlier, these are slanted. These are slanted from the thumb side to the pinky side. 
and the A finger is much more symmetrical. Not to get too bogged down with nail stuff, but you kind of have to get it. Anyway, so we're going to sit in this great position so that it brings the hand right to where we'd like it to be. We're going to rest the thumb somewhere because we're going to work on trebles first. And you can let rest it on any string that you want. Um, the secret is that you rest it so that it's touching that spot between the nail and the flesh that we're going to want to pluck it eventually. So just set it there really gently. No pressure, just like a butterfly sitting on, on a flower. So the work is this, really simple. Several steps. You're going to set the thumb at the nail and the flesh on a bass string, because we're just going to work on trebles for now. And you're going to relax, listen to the silence of the world, bring the finger to the string, and land one billionth of a millimeter from the nail. Then put a little weight on it, relax. You can feel the nail and the flesh right now. They feel balanced. And then all of a sudden at a really quantum event, a motion that happens very quickly at once, we're going to use the flexor muscles. On, those are the muscles on the inside of the fingers that pull. We're going to use the flexor muscle to very quickly bring the fingertip to the adjacent string. When I get to the adjacent, adjacent string, I'm going to relax the finger so there's, it's still on the string, but it's not putting any weight on it. Then I'm going to bring the finger back to exactly the same point that we started a moment ago, near the flesh and nail, and set it down, relax, hear a silence, feel your body, feel your fingertip and nail intersecting with the string and then engage those flexor muscles. Listen to the string until it's gone, and then do it again. That sounds pretty good. And I'm sort of having a good time. So that's what to do. Now this was a particular stroke that classical guitarists use. They call it apoyando, which is uh, Spanish, but it means re we call it rest stroke in English. It's where you pluck a string and land on the adjacent string. Now we don't have to do it that way all the time, and most of the time we won't do it that way. Most of what we do is called free stroke. And it's all exactly the same. You land at the sweet spot, Relax, listen to the universe, and I'm going to play the index finger, but I'm going to move all the fingers with it. I have the other fingers set just inside of the one I'm going to use. If I was using M, these guys would be in. If I was using A, these guys would be in. But they're all going to move together, and they're all going to move from the big knuckles, not so much from these, and certainly not at all from these. They're all going to move like, poof, poof, but only one guy is going to actually make the sound. So I'm setting the index finger at the flesh and nail, I'm relaxing, getting ready, and then bam. And I'm going to bring the fingers, fingertips all the way to the back of my palm. Sorry, the back of my palm. Like this moving from the big knuckle. So here's a rest stroke. And here's a free stroke. Oh, sounds good. Feels good. But we want to try and make them the same. So here's a rest stroke. And here's a free stroke. That's really close, you know, and it, it's close enough because when you're playing music, as things go by pretty fast. And the reason that the free stroke sounds actually close to the same as the rest stroke is because the finger's moving more. It's moving all the way back to the palm. Whereas in rest stroke, it's just moving down to the next string. This is specific stuff 
but it's it's what makes really beautiful tone, and we want really beautiful tone. And don't forget, we have uh, six other strings to do, so you can do the G string, free stroke, rest stroke, E string, and you'll notice that my thumb follows it up. The higher the string is, my thumb's going to rest two strings, maybe three beats it. And then here, here. It's not specific. You can do it as many strings away as feels comfortable. And eventually, we're not going to anchor the thumb at all. But that's another lesson. Now, don't forget we have to do the thumb as well. We're only going to use the thumb on the basses. And for now, we'll just use the fingers on the trebles. So thumb, you're going to rest all your fingers at the flesh and nail on the G, B, and E string. And your thumb's going to come down and it's going to land at the flesh and nail. Sorry about this ugly thumbnail. It's a, it still works, but it's going to land at the flesh and the nail. And it's going to do just free strokes for now. I'm going to pluck it so that its trajectory takes it to the bend, this first uh, knuckle joint. Flange. It's, it's actually called a flange. This is the distal flange, if you want to do doctor talk. So I'm going to make the thumb, its vector is going to be away from the string, and it's going to contact the distal flange. And that was a pretty nice sound. So you can do the same thing with the thumb. I wouldn't do rest stroke for now. You can leave the fingers where they are on, th on three, two, and one. D string. Sorry, I can't see it. I don't have my glasses on. Just remember the thumb is going to move from this joint that joint. No. The thumb is going to move from that joint. Um, it's a, it's very different than how the fingers move, but it's real simple. Some people move it from that. Some people's joint can't even move there, and mine is, uh, is that case. This joint won't move for me. This one will, but I don't use it very much when I play guitar. It's all from here. A lot of this is all about mass. You know, if I move this whole mass it's going to make more sound than if I just move this mass. Yeah, I love physics. <laughs> so that's it. Uh, that's a great start. And uh, feel free to send me an email if you have questions. And feel free to take this, this mission on. It's, it's a lovely thing. It's, it's carried me since the, the mid-70s. I've been loving doing this. Don't forget it also works for steel string players too. Uh, I'm sure you can hear that when people record onto microphones that there is a great, uh, rather rather vast difference in tone from one player to another. And it's all about how do you strike the string. I guess we've talked enough about this. I could talk about it a lot more, but I think we got this. Um, just. Yeah, we'll talk about vibrato in another lesson. Thanks for sticking out. Good luck. Go practice. Make beautiful sound. Adios.